2020, our vision, CJC Life, our vision, our team, our staff, and everybody working together to, to focus on one thing that we want all of us to have an encounter with Jesus. And Jesus is being spread out, you know, throughout the history, throughout the word of God. Everybody have a different perspective about Jesus. Every perspective of, is, is pretty much real to that person who has the perspective of Jesus. But our job is to unpack me even more about Jesus so that we can grow in God and we can have the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Then we can be blessing to not only our families, but those that are connected to us as well. So we started off a couple sermons, and I want to talk about it at the end. So I want to take the text first to read the text to uh, to bring a context of what we're going to be, you know, talking about today or discussing about today. Because um, some of you probably were not here all three weeks. You may be here first time. So I want you to get this whole context. We took the whole chapter, we dissected it four different sermons. And now I'm going to read the whole thing and I'm going to land on the, the last portion of the scriptures that God has laid on our, on our hearts today. So Luke 24, verse 13, this event happened right after Jesus rose from the dead. When Jesus rose from the dead, the entire Jerusalem was in under confusion under darkness, under absolute brutal, you know, uh, chaos, and part of, part of the foreigners came to Jerusalem celebrating, uh, you know, a, a Riva festival, and they call it Passover, everybody's getting drunk and wine and just having great time, it's just a mixed emotions going on, disciples were under arrest in their hearts, they were absolutely ostracized from society, from theology, from God, from faith, from everything, and they were by themselves in fear, peeing in their pants, and stuck in Jerusalem, could not even go grab a taco down the road, and they were stuck in Jerusalem, and at that time, this woman who were bold, can I tell you something, no matter what happens, there's some woman, they're tenacious about something. When they want to do something, you can't stop them. Can I hear amen from a woman? When they, when they want to do something, you can't stop them. They are the one. Amen. If they, have to, if they have to push the baby without a help, they can push that baby. Get your hands off of me. I can do by myself. I can push it. And they have the tenacity in them. And this woman rose early in the morning in respect of the, what the culture was doing. They walked up to the tomb. They just want to anoint Jesus because he's so good to them. So they want to anoint him. Is there any woman that God is born so good to you that you don't want to sit back and wait somebody to follow you that you pick up and follow because you know God is being so good to you. I need a, two women who have that courage to stand up and say, yes, God is being so good to me that I will do what God has called me to do. I'm not going to sit back and let the government decide. I'm not going to sit back what the Romans will decide. I will do it because he's been so good to me. Church may be not told so good to me, Pastors may be not so good to me, but God is being so good to me, and I will do it because it is my responsibility to do it. This woman, man, I feel like I'm already ahead of my preaching here. I need to slow down because I feel this wind coming this way, and I just cannot resist it. I try to talk to the wind. I said, "Can you just slow me down so I can, I can, I can get my thoughts out?" But sometimes it's a, it's a combination. That's what we call the anointing. Yeah, anointing. I don't know. You know. The last thing you want to do with me is give me a microphone. Don't give me a microphone. I, uh, I you know, I just, just I, I'm a mess when I have a microphone. Some people, you know, get nervous, but I will be a mess when I get a microphone. It's just like everywhere I get this direction coming, and I just want to, you know, I don't really care what people think about me. End of the day, I don't care what my accent sounds like. I'm going to preach it because I just feel that God has been so good to my life. Oh, oh, you don't know worry how he's been so good I could have been a dead by now but God picked me up from a poverty and put me in a San Antonio that I can be a voice in the city so that God will get the glory I told you I need to shut up I say shut up, shut up. so good to me his goodness is outruns our life sometimes when we're you know it's, God has been so good to us and this woman, man, same day that woman went, anointed, and Jesus appeared to them first time in a whole different glory. And even Mary Magdalene could not understand him. And he told the woman, go tell my brothers that I'm going to Galilee. 
And two angels that were in the tomb, they said, why are you looking dead among living? Go tell disciples and Peter, I have risen, I'm on my way. So two angels have seen something so amazing. And the same day evening, this story took place. That now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. About seven miles from Jerusalem. And verse 14 says that they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Verse 15, and they talked and discussed these things with each other. And Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. Now, that Jesus is not the same Jesus that was with them three and a half years. This is a Jesus that was risen from the dead. Now, he didn't, he didn't just risen from the dead a normal man. That's not a normal resurrection. The man was put on behalf of us on the cross. And all the sicknesses that ever be invented by humankind, the world, the pollution, the political system, was upon him. So he's not only destroyed the power of sin, he's also destroyed the power of sickness. And above all, he was surrounded by bulls of Bashan and psalmist says that means the demonic forces now he's all not only destroyed the sin not only destroyed the sickness he also destroyed the powers of darkness and the devil's been destroyed on the cross and he won the battle he killed them so many things and he went to the grave and he risen from the grave by the glory of his father now he has a new nature than the nature that he had before he was in the glory of the father appeared to him but watch this they kept they were kept from recognizing him they could not recognize him Verse 17 says, he asked them, what are you discussing about together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleophas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? 19, and uh, what things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet. Can you underline if your Bible, if you can, he was a prophet. But now he is not. So he was a prophet, he was powerful in world, deed before God. In all people, verse 20, the chief priest and the rulers handed him over to the sentence to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more is the third day since all this took place, in addition, some of our women amazed us. These are the women, bold women. They always amaze you. Yeah, if you're sitting here, give yourself a big round of applause because you will amaze some people. You know, they're like, oh, what you going to do? I'm, oh, yeah, you better come and touch me. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, <laughs> they, they went to the tomb early this morning in verse 23, and, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that he, they, they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Verse 24, then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. Verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are, you slow to believe all that prophets have spoken. And did not Messiah have to suffer these things then enter his glory? Is this is a good kind of a preaching text to me? The reason preaching te is te text to me is if you're going through something, get ready. You're ready to get into something new that you never get into. If you're facing a challenge, what God is doing in the challenge, He's preparing you a room for you to get to a new promotion. 
I don't know who I'm preaching. You might be, you might be at the end of the rope of the suffering because you're getting ready to go into a new thing that God has prepared for you. Satan sometimes will bring a fight into your territory, but God will let the fight happen in your territory because God has been planning all through the decades of place which is greater than your own generation. If you're willing to suffer for a bit, you're about to see a greater things. You're coming into a greater things. Yes, 2019 may be a, a painful thing, but get ready, baby. 2020 is about to be a blessing. It's about to be a breakthrough. It's about to be a victorious. It's about to be a, a prosperous year in 2020. Because as he suffered, we suffered with him. But the thing with him, we were not with him when he suffered. He suffered alone. Why? Because 2,000 years later, that you will go through a suffering that he know exactly what it feels like suffering so he can step in into your suffering and partner with you and go through you with you and make every impossible possible through suffering in your life. If you're going through something, cheer up and give Jesus one more round of applause because you're getting ready to something amazing. In verse 27, this is my favorite scripture in the season that I'm in. <laughs> and the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. The Old Testament divided into three sections. The first section they call, or we call, a law. Second section is a prophet. The third section is David's amazing psalms and other writings. They call them writings. But all through these sections, Jesus appears. And you can read Bible, sometimes it's hard for you to find that out. And that's why God will send the teachers, preachers, evangelists, and prophets to unpack that. Sometimes some of us will think, well, I don't need anybody to teach me the Bible. I can sit home and learn. And it's a great idea. And you should do that. But sometimes it's hard for you to understand everything. So sometimes when you, when you go to church and hear a preacher say, so you, know, you kind of get some perspective and start journeying into it. And God will reveal that to you. And sometimes every preacher, including myself, we don't really preach everything that, that you think we should be preaching. Sometimes we have a human element to it, fa failure to do it, our frustrations in it, our pains in it, especially me as a pastor. When I bleed, it comes in my messages. When I hurt, it comes in my messages. But sometimes people get blessings, sometimes people get offended, and I'm, I can't help it. But what I would recommend, that when you baked a good chicken, you know, and chicken smells really good when it's baking, right? I mean, because the bones are in it, so that's why it smells really good. So, but when you're eating it, you're not just going to eat the bones. You eat the meat and you throw the what? Bones. So, same thing. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm wrong, a scripture is right. Scriptures are always right. <laughs> it's for <worth> somebody. <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I, I'm, I guarantee you I'm not. And I can tell you this. I'm not going to promise I will not make mistakes. I will make mistakes. Can you give me grace on that, right? I'll make mistakes. Because as we make mistakes, then we get better. We get learned. We do, we do, we do life better. And, it, and it, this is the challenge that we're living in a society. We put a preacher in a high level and super exp, uh, expectations on him. And then not knowing what he has to carry from everything else. I mean... You know, sometimes it's, 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 it's a different ball game to be a pastor. It's one thing to look at a pastor and just make a judgment. The another thing to become a pastor and do the service and do the church. Amen. And, and uh, you know, you get nervous when you get on the stage. And I get nervous every day because I got to live a life before the Lord before I come up the stage and to give the God's word. So it's a, it's a lifestyle that God is looking for. And I, I was so grateful when Claire and Sharon came to my office this week. They call me off, and I love that when people call me off. Well, preacher, you said uh, in, in this message that uh, three points Jesus is looking for. And you only shared one point, and you forgot about two points. And if you don't, if you don't remember, you don't remember, because you're probably here last Sunday. You're like, what, what did, I, did he say that? <clears throat> but I like when uh, Phil comes, comes, Phil also will tell me sometimes, 
uh uh-uh, that's a bad, bad preaching preacher. And, and sometimes I'll say, Phil, just shut up. No, I'm just kidding. I won't shut up. But, but they called me out. And I said, yeah, I forgot. You know, sometimes when you make a point and you tag along and you go to something else, and it, God is looking for three things, and I'll, I'll just make that up right now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> three things. Number one, God is looking for a character of person. And we talked about character is not always perfect. Character is somebody who's willing to recognize the mistakes and repent and move forward. It's a great character. Can somebody bless the Lord? When you have that character, man, you're, you're moving in the right direction. You're going in the right direction. The second thing God is looking for to see how we manage our time. Because once you spend your time, you spent it. You cannot manufacture your time. You can manufacture talent. You can manufacture, you know, gifting, but you cannot manufacture your time. So God always looks at how we spend our time. If you're watching TV too much, God is watching you as you're watching TV as well. So you could do something with that with the time being spent. Nowadays, Netflix is on a rampage making multi-billion franchise in the next two years because they want your eyes and your heart and your mind are they going to get you i mean these are the works now you know everybody's starting streaming companies now disney started streaming company now i think itunes are starting streaming company walmart is thinking i mean everybody's going to start streaming company because they need everybody to watch their stuff and because because it is it is a culturally going that direction but we need to make sure our time is spent well because if you spend your time well God will bring you blessings. The third one is you spend your talents well. God give us everybody a talent in this room. If you have a talent, give God a hand clap because God gives you that gifting, the talent. When you spend it well, use it well, God will get the glory. So those are my three points for Sharon and Claire. And I'm what? <laughs> so, but, but this is where I'm going to start off my message. I know I already preached for 15 minutes, but... Um, so continuation of the text they drew near to the village to which they were going he appeared to be going further so jesus at this place now you can see he's been talking to them about scriptures coming to the village and as soon as he sensed they're going that way to village jesus is going a different direction i want you to keep that in your heart and we'll come back to preaching i just want to talk i will just read this and then we'll discuss that and but they constrained him they constrained him saying stay with us for it is towards evening the day is now far spent so he went in stay with them verse 30 says when he was at the table with them took the bread blessed it broke it and gave it to them and as he gave it to them watch what had happened and their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished out of their sight immediately Jesus was out of their sight verse 32 said they said to each other did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road while he opened to us the scripture so as Jesus was talking to them about scriptures they did not know that was Jesus but their hearts were burning as Jesus was talking to them. Verse 33, and they rose at the same hour. Somebody says same hour. Shift happened at the same hour. Same hour returned to Jerusalem. And they found the 11 gathered together and those that were with them. And, uh, and who said the Lord has risen indeed has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road. And how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. It's just an incredible story. The whole story is like amazing. So the title that I want to give to this message is which direction? Which direction should I go when it comes to my next season or in this season that as God is leading me? So we talked about three messages in this sermon series. The first one I titled it, Can You See? And second one, we titled it, What Things, because Jesus titled that in the, in the text. In the last, the, the, last, the before one, uh, we, t- we titled, Where Do You Go? But today, we want to talk about, you know, which direction. So I want to just to take a few minutes to kind of drive 
what God has put in our hearts in the text. You know, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to stick with the text most of the times, but I like to use my examples that I have understood the text and also how God led me in my life in the text. So I can also send that signals here if somebody gets it and it gets blessing with it and then have the ability to make a decision for next move of your life, which is amazing, which is, which is what I'm looking for end of the day. So <clears throat> from, from Jerusalem, you know, they, it's, it's a chaos in Jerusalem. Disciples were locked themselves in Jerusalem, somewhere hidden underground, peeing in their pants because they think they're going to be killed the next day. But I like about these two guys, even though the, all the disciples were in fear, in, in, in dangerous place, of course, and they were hiding somewhere back there. But the two disciples decided to go to a town called Emos. So I did a little bit of studies about this theological uh, uh, archaeology positions. When I went to you know, Israel, I grabbed a big Jewish book. I wanted to learn about more cultural things. And they have a different perspective about this place. They didn't believe this place was seven miles from Jerusalem. There's a call Ema. Seven miles from Jerusalem because writer says seven miles. So they measured seven miles in Jerusalem what place they were going to. So they find out that at the time when Luke was writing the town named Emos, but today there's no town called Emos. So they went back and studied from Jacob's lifestyle, from Jacob onwards, and they found out that is the place where Jacob had encountered God, and which is called Bethel. So Bethel is also same place as Emos. Now you kind of connect the dots as, as I'm preaching here. So these disciples who were part of this moment who believed that God would do what they think God should do. And a lot of times we all start off Christianity or any theology, religion, expecting God should do as God he is. And sometimes we get surprised by how come God did not do what he, what we think he should do, what we think he's capable to do, but God is a different God. God has a different ways to do. He says in his word, his thoughts are higher. His ways are different than our ways because when Jesus came to this earth, when he was preaching about kingdom of God, they translated as a kingdom of Israel. You look at book of Acts and you can find that disciples, every one of them, three and a half years, followed him believing that he's going to bring the kingdom to Israel. Yet Jesus has been communicating using the parables to articulate invisible force of a kingdom of God. He's talking about kingdom that the mankind has never seen before. You probably heard about it, but I did not come to bring another kingdom as it was in a Babylon, as it was in a Greece, as it was in a Medo Persians, as it is right now in a Roman citizen. No, no, this is not the citizenship I'm bringing. Um, this is not the kingdom I'm bringing. I'm bringing a kingdom as it is in heaven. It's about to manifest on this earth. In heaven, there is a joy. What I am about to do is I'm bringing heaven to this earth so everybody will be equally yoked. Everybody will be equal in the eyes of God. There is no slavery in the eyes of God because there is a freedom in heaven so I'm bringing that freedom on this earth. And he was talking about the kingdom of God and the disciples posting on Instagram kingdom of Israel. And don't judge yourself when you mistranslate the scripture. Because the disciples who saw him doing miracles, who saw him raising the dead, who saw him doing an incredible things, yet mistranslated his very words. Yet we can do the same thing. So Jesus was not talking about kingdom that they were being thinking about sometimes we gotta be patient when we pray we pray you ask God I want you to do this this and this and God doesn't do it and you wonder why God doesn't do it God is not one to do it he wants to do it but the way he's gonna do it is totally different than the way you've been expecting him to do it the way he's gonna show up in your life is gonna be totally different than the way he's gonna be doing one day I was being asking God I've been tithing but I've been praying for this financial breakthrough it did not happen. And where is this my tithing 
power coming God and God opened my door and let me see an avenue that I have not seen all my decades. Look at you, Philip. For two decades, I've been protecting you in this area that you didn't even know it. Because of your tithing, I'm able to de de broke the devourers in your life and God was able to do it is in his own terms. He doesn't have to follow my policy. I'm required to follow his policy. I am not the creator. He is the creator. I am the clay in a, in a, in a, in a man that holding my life. So I got to learn to submit to a God who is over my life. I cannot submit to a, the things that I believe in. I got to come to a place where I got to submit to God what he's doing in my life. If you're submitting to God, say amen. Because when you submit to him, He's not only able to let you see the difference between my ideology or your ideology and his ideology. He's also going to let you see his motives, his intentions, and his heart behind everything he does. Then you're able to process the information according to what he thinks. Not according to what people think. Not according to what your future or the past should look like things, but God will reveal things that only you can able to understand. So these people that they were stuck in that, in that, in that underground because they were afraid because Romans will come and kill them because they were confused in the mixed message. Jesus did not confuse them. Jesus preached the right message, but the hearers heard the wrong message. Have you ever been in a conversation? Somebody tells you something that they heard, somebody else told them, and by the time it comes to your ear, it's totally translated in a different version of what you first heard. And it's just the way that we grew up and we, we were, as a humans, in, in a culture we're living in, and, and disciples mistranslated everything Jesus did but I like about these two guys Cleophas said yo I know Peter is not going to go nowhere Thomas is forget about this dude he's doubting every day um, I gotta go yo I gotta go I gotta go me San Antonio I gotta grab some nice carne guisada taco with the cheese and melting on it and me, as an Indian, I want to put eggs on top of it. I just, I don't need to eat taco. I need a burrito. So I want to feel like a man kind of food, you know. I want to go. Cleopas said, I'm hungry. Are you hungry? And so one of the other disciples said, I, I don't know, man. man. If we go out, they're going to kill you. He said, I don't care, man. If they kill me, they kill me, man. But I, I got to go. I got to eat. I, mean, I got to go. And Cleopas steps out of the boat. He's like, I'm going. And along with him, I don't know, he's his brother, his friend. Bible is silent, so I'm going to be silent. I'm not going to be saying what Bible didn't say. <laughs> and they both were start taking journey. And, and they were going to the place where Jacob had an encounter way back in days. So what Cleophas thought, I'm going to follow my forefathers, what they used to do. Because one day when Elijah challenged the people of God. He said, God, he said, if you believe a God of Israel, I want you to come to the Mount Carmel and I'm going to show you today who our God is and who's their God is. And that day, 150 Baal, the followers of a Baal worshippers came and there's, it's a mass, you know, crusade is happening at that Mount Carmel and he made a fun of all their guards and all their religion and end of the day Israelites killed 150 thousand people that are worshiping a wrong false gods and it was a chaos in Israel because of one man who was able to challenge the people that you're, you're worshiping a wrong god a false god and all of a sudden Elijah prayed fire came from heaven and, and fire burned the altar and the voice of the victory went into everywhere it was a chaos and it happened in Elijah time as it was happening right now in Jerusalem. And what had happened was, next day Elijah woke up, went down the street, got, got him a caramel macchiato from Starbucks, 
<clears throat> and that's kind of my, you won't find that in the Bible, by the way. What? Starbucks? That's just my preaching. You know? I like to add spices to it. I just, that's just the way I think in my head. So, you know, <laughs> I'm taking your journey with me. So Elijah looks at his phone as usual to check his email. And he saw the text. And he saw that message coming from a Jezebel saying that you, Elijah, you thought you won it. You thought you got it. Today, tomorrow, by this time, I'm going to kill you. And Elijah, who knew God, who has got the power to pull the power down, started peeing in his pants. As, that's not in the Bible, by the way. It's just, yeah. Because Elijah got afraid of the enemy's voices. Why? Elijah was a man like you and I. So when he was under the anointing, the anointing did the miracle, but the anointing lifted off. He became like a normal man and the fear started coming to him and he knew only one thing, that I got to get back to the place where God met Moses. So he went to Mount mountain where God gave a ten commandments he was taking journey on the way Elijah was tired and the angels fed him and Elijah finally reached the place and God spoke to him so these two disciples figured out that I'm going to do the same way my fathers have done it Jerusalem is a mess Jerusalem is in a bloodshed right now it's a confused place I'm going to go to a Bethel where Jacob had an encounter with God so he's going towards that way but he doesn't know either don't even have a faith where they're going they're just going and I like to talk about people who don't know what they're going to get from church but they are committed to go to church every Sunday no matter what happens because they're so decided to get themselves to a church because that's what we were taught I don't know what else you were taught I grew up in going to church Sundays I'm not going nowhere Sundays Netflix can take a pause button on my life Sunday morning I bring myself in the house of God I don't understand it all but I know for sure that something good is about to happen when I bring myself to the house of God can you give God a hand if you believe in going to church on Sunday and along the way they were going to the place of Bethel and guess who appears to them Jesus appears to them now you know why Jesus did not appear to these 11 disciples who were stuck underground. And may I say again, pain in their pants. Because Jesus always is looking for somebody who's willing to take a risk to do something for the kingdom of God. And when you take a risk and take your step and going forward to do whatever, whatever it might be look like, it may not be look like agreeing to this pastor or that pastor. No, no, no. This is what God told me. I'm going to do it. I'm going to follow what God has told me. And as I'm doing it, God can strengthen me. And Jesus came to these two disciples. I always question this, Pastor. Why would Jesus only come to this two? The leaveners needed more comfort. They're the one confused and all that. But Jesus did not go to the leaven yet. He went later. But he appeared to this first two. And these two were going on. And when he came to them, they could not recognize him. And we learned that the second lesson. And then as they're coming to the, the closer, because your journey... That you take whatever journey God has laid in your heart, it's only one journey. Sometimes we don't have a second chance. There's some things we will have second chance. But there's some things you don't have a second chance. You can't go to hell, you know, miss the mark and go to hell and say, God, I made a mistake. I need another option to get back to heaven. At the time, it's too late. That's why God gave us 80 plus years, 60 plus years for us to hear the God, God's word, to make the decision that I got to take this journey, not that journey. This is the journey that I should go to, that the man died for me and for my life, and I need to get back on that thing that he did for me so that I can give my life to him so I can get saved and go to the place where God has a place for me. And these two disciples made a journey towards this place what they thought, what they thought their forefathers have done and forefathers 
I've, I've done it. And then they followed the journey. And along their journey, God appears to him. You know, God wants to see where you're headed to. And based on where you're headed to, God will send a help on the way. Because sometimes you feel like there is no help in the journey. Maybe we're going the wrong direction. Maybe our destiny is a wrong destiny. But when your destiny is the destiny that's going to glorify God, that's going to glorify what he called you to do, then the help is on the way. Help will always come and help you to get it. And I like about how Jesus appears to them as a stranger, but he didn't, he didn't jump on it. You know, this is good for the preachers who go and yell at people to get saved. And he could have, he could have right away jumped in and said, Yo, Cleophas, you can recognize me. It's me, yo, Jesus. Shut your mouth and, and let me talk to you about salvation. That's not what he did. He appears to them as a stranger. He comes to them as a stranger. He respected their conversation. He said, what are you guys talking about? They said, blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay, that's good. And what things are you discussing? They said, this, this, this. And then he get into conversation. It is a great way to build relationship with the people when you value them where they are. But if you don't value them where they are, you can lead them where they want to go or where they want to follow. Because they couldn't follow this stranger because he's absolutely a stranger. But based on the conversation Jesus was having with them, gave them confidence to follow the stranger. A lot of times people can follow strangers. It's hard to follow strangers. Some of you probably come to church and say, man, I hear this Indian preacher preaching, but I have no idea who this dude is. And I get it. I get it. Sometimes, you know, you only translate in 30 minutes about my life, but you don't know me, and I don't know you. But when we get to know each other, when we build a relationship with them, then there is a confidence in that relationship. Then you start, you start following the thing that God has laid in our hearts so we can lead you. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing. It's a great leadership lesson that before you lead somebody, connect with them. Before you tell them what they should do, hear what they're talking at the time. And then you can able to lead them into the destiny that you want to go. And even as they're going into their destiny, Jesus never made them detour. Jesus never said, turn around. This is our destination. Y'all leaving from Jerusalem. That's totally wrong. That's not what you should do. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus followed with them to their destiny. Can I tell you something? That God made a covenant with you, and wherever you go, he will go with you, unless until you open your eyes, he will go with you, and along the way, he's going to strengthen you, equip you, empower you, can somebody bless the Lord, he's going to go with you, that is, a, that is a great shouting moment, yes, people may not going to go with you, because you're going in a wrong direction, but God will go with you, until you reach the destination, and God can turn that around for your life. And don't let others discourage you or disappoint you. You let God be part of your life. Keep going. I mean, they're going the wrong direction. Jesus knew they're going the wrong direction, but they didn't. But Jesus accepted the process. Jesus agreed the process. Jesus validated their conversation. Jesus validated their, their time of being. And they, they can see the chaos in Jerusalem. They feel like they want to go to a Bethel where they can hear from God but God was already meeting them on the way to Bethel they don't have to go to Bethel and hear from God but they are as they're going God was with them and talking to them and I like about the scripture that I'm going to put if you can put the scripture uh, the constraining scripture so they were coming close to um, you know uh, they came to close to village they draw close to village and watch this Jesus was now departing as if he doesn't have nothing to do with it. So sometimes his departure or the, when, when Jesus, when you feel like God is walking away from you, does not mean God is leaving you forever. No, what God is doing here is so powerful. I want you to pause here for a minute and listen to me carefully. When they were on the boat, when Jesus told them go to the other side, they were all on the boat. Jesus that night walked on a water and passing by them, feeling to see what they're going to recognize him. Because when they recognize him, that's the only time he's going to respond to them. So when, when Jesus was appeared to them as a ghost, one of the disciples started calling him, is that you Jesus? And 
Jesus said, now thank you, Peter, that you recognize my new level of dimension, my new level of understanding. Now I'm going to call you into a destiny that you've been seeking to. I'm going to call you into a new level that you've been praying to. I'm going to call you into a new page of your purpose. And now I'm appearing to you in that level. And I'm going to call you. And now you can step out of the boat and start walking on a water. Even though water cannot hold you because I have called you, you can start walking on the impossible door, on the impossible path because I'm able to keep you on the things that cannot keep you naturally but spiritually I can carry you into it. But if Peter would never constrain him, this is the power of constraining. Jesus will, will withdraw from you to see if you could seek him. And I was playing with my daughter the other day. And I was playing with her. She was having a great time. As long as I was in that room with her, she didn't really pay attention to me that much. She was paying attention to the toys. But the moment I sneaked out of the room closely, her attraction towards toys start expiring. Because she knew somebody that's supposed to be in the room is disappearing slowly. I'm not worshiping him for the toys. The toy can bless me, but the toy cannot keep me. I gotta have a man who is going to be with me. As soon as he walks out of the room, I'm gonna chase after him. I'm gonna go after him. I'm gonna seek the Lord. Can somebody give the Lord a hate If you're gonna seek him with all your heart, I'm gonna seek him. And they... Jesus was testing. So this is what Jesus does. Jesus gives you the word and then he will test you. Satan will tempt you, but God will test you. And God gave Abraham the most powerful prayer that he prayed 20 long years. Man, when you pray for 20 long years, you better, you better know what you're going to get. It's a real good deal. 20 long years later, he gets this amazing thing that God did for him and the son was born to him he was being so excited about it I mean you, you only know in between the struggle that he had but all the struggle that he went through to believe on God to have this one promise and God tells him bring the boy and kill him but Abraham knew better now this is good for somebody if God is taking you a longer to answer your prayer. God is not taking longer to answer your prayer. As you, as God is holding that miracle longer, you're going to become a super mature to the point where you're going to be equally yoked with God and thinking like God. God doesn't want to, God doesn't want to stop a blessing. God wants you to think like him. God wants you to have a conversation with him. God wants you to come to a new level of understanding about every miracle that he did. And Abraham did come to that level of understanding. He knew if God can take this boy, he has to raise him from the dead because he gave a blessing to me and I believe a God who is able to raise everything, anything that's been dead and he can raise that boy up again and that's what kept him going and he was seeking God in a new level and a new direction and Romans says, if you're worried about maybe he had his own weak moments, some preachers will say he has his own weak moments, no, read Romans chapter 4, Paul says Abraham did not stagger on his promises. He believed God with all his mind. If you long wait for 20 long years, you become a man like that. You become a tenacious man. You become a perfect man. You become a man that will go after God with all your heart. He did. Because God was want Abraham to come to another level. So he brought him to the level where including judgment God could not do by himself. He comes to Abraham. Abraham, I want to take care of the city. What do you think? Abraham says, well, if you, have, if you have some righteous, would you do that, Lord? He's like, no. And he said a word. Read the book of Genesis. Can I hide anything from Abraham? Why? Abraham learned to press him into God to the point where he become friend of God. 
If anybody wants to be a friend of God, it's one thing to sing, I'm a friend of God. It's another thing to be a friend of God. You got to have a drive and tenacious towards God. No matter who is walking with you, no matter whether Sarah is laughing at the whole thing, but I'm not going to be a friend. I will walk with God rest of my life and go to the point where God is leading me to the destiny. Come on, somebody bless the Lord with all your heart. And then God can start sharing sharing things that you've been crying out for him. If they did not constrain him, watch the word constrain. Is Everick here? Everick, are you here, buddy? Come on here, buddy. Because he's a good looking, so I'm going to put him in a camera. <laughs> Give him a big round of applause. Is, look at him, like he looks handsome. He's, got, he's going to be... It's going to be in a military camera, guys. It's going to focus us for a few seconds. We'll give him some time. Because I want you to look handsome. All right. Are you handsome? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, handsome. so let's imagine Jesus. You're not Jesus forever, though. Right? Just, just for the illustration, I want to make sure. <laughs> no, and don't hashtag Jesus, though. You know? So pretend like he's Jesus, and I'm Cleophas, and, 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 and another guy. So we heard Jesus gave all these words. Now we forget about what had happened in Jerusalem. All the chaos was left us because the word has a power to destroy any doubt and fear that might be lingering in our hearts. And word destroyed it. Now Jesus ready to go the other direction. And we're supposed to go this direction. In their hearts, this is what they're doing. I want you to pretend like you're going that direction. And I'm going to hold your arms and, and keep walking that direction. Keep walking. And I'm, I'm constraining him. I said, Jesus, you can't be leaving me. I know I understand that. I may be, I may not understand everything. But they don't know this was Jesus. They knew this was a stranger who broke the barrier in their heart. If anybody knows that if somebody comes in your life and break the curses in your life. And that you understand that you're connecting to that person. You can't be going away from my life. you got to hold with me. Because of your prayers, my wife got pregnant. I can't let that go. I know how God worked in my life. I got to hold that thing. I got to hold that thing. I want you to go. Keep going that way. I want you to go. And this is what they were doing with Jesus. They were constraining him. Can somebody give the Lord a hand clap for, for every? Thank you, every. They were, they were constraining him saying, stay. Stay. Did not know what is the outcome of that stay. They probably thought we got to cook him a dinner. This is a stranger. We don't know. And when he was at the table, he broke the bread. Now, it sounds like a communion, but it's not a communion. Pay attention to this. He didn't, he didn't give a wine. He only broke. He took the bread. In the communion, he thanked the bread. But here, there is no thanking. He took it directly and he broke it. He blessed it. He broke it and he gave it to them. And Jesus didn't tell them that my name is Jesus. I am the one resurrected. You know, I came to show you all this. That's not what he did. As they ate the bread, their eyes were what? Open. And watch this. They recognized him. Jesus did not reveal to them. They recognized him. And Jesus did not tell them that it is me, I'm the one risen from the dead. No, immediately he vanished away from their sight. And they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn when he was talking to us? So breaking the bread opened the struggle that they were under. The scriptures that you hear will encourage you, will motivate you, will also take you to the new levels in God. But the moment when you understand the ultimate purpose of knowing scriptures, then you're able to recognize him better. Same Bible has the principles. Same Bible has a revelatory knowledge. Rhema word. Logos word. Logos are word that is written. 
Rhema or the word that you hear as you read something. Principles are one that we use it. J.C. Penney got a prosperous company with the principles. Hobby Lobby became a prosperous company with the principles. But that's not what Jesus revealed. They're all great. We got we to grow into them. But what Jesus was doing here is entire scriptures are written or given to one purpose. That is being the broken bread. What is Jesus saying that? Now you've been following me because I will make the kingdom of Israel manifest. But that's not why I came to this church. That's not why I came to this nation. That's not why I came to this Israel the reason I came to this Israel because I am called to be broken. When you recognize my brokenness, then you can recognize my ascension. When you recognize why I gave my life to you, then you recognize why your life is so important to God. When you recognize that Jesus died for you, then you recognize I surrender all. When you recognize Jesus gave it all, then you will say, I will submit to my husband as unto the Lord because he died in my place. Now I can submit. And when you recognize Jesus died in your place, then you can be crucified as a husband to that family. Recognizing. They recognized him. At the recognition, when you break the bread, they recognized him. And then they saw the whole piece of it. And I looked at another one too here. I have two points. I want to give and then I'll close it. The, the, uh, the next point that I was thinking. They, they know Jesus in a way. Through miracles, through, you know, doing a lot of things that Jesus did. But when Jesus rose from the dead, I'm trying to put it in a sentence so you, we can all think about it. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. I need a fire on energy, coffee. Help me, Lord. But this is, this is, it came to me very powerfully. I'm not going to say it powerfully. But it really came to me powerfully. How do I say it, Phil? <laughs> this is the problem with a guy who speaks five languages and decodes everything and encodes and encodes, decodes and encodes. I should just stick to one language. <laughs> so, people understood about resurrection totally different than how Jesus revealed the resurrection to us in this text. So, resurrection in the, in the, in the context. A lot of times we know Jesus has risen from the dead. But how many times when you tell people they don't really feel that resurrection. They're like, well, I see history says it. Preachers preach on it. People think on it. And I get it, but I don't, I don't really feel it. So this was that kind of text. That if you want to feel the resurrection to the point where you know you're going to believe with all your heart. You have to let the word of God be digesting inside of you. Because when they took the journey of two and a half hours, he was unpacking the scriptures from prophets, from law, from Moses. And all of a sudden, there's something is happening to them because the hearts were burning with the word. And watch this, the word was not preached as Jesus to them. The word was preached as a stranger to them. What is the point? The point here is, you might be looking at the word as a stranger, but if you keep on looking at the word, the word will witness to you back to you and the word will reveal that there is a resurrection in the scriptures itself by the power of the Holy Spirit you can feel the word has been risen from the dead he could have told them I'm Jesus but he didn't so people like us 
who wanted to have encounters like this. Man, Paul had an encounter. I wish I had that encounter. Where Moses have an encounter. I wish I have an encounter. All these people have a brutal encounters and they're good, they're bad. They're sometimes disturbing and afraid. Uh, how come I don't have that encounter? But can I tell you something? Now God wants us to have an encounter not with a person but with the word of God. Because once we start reading the word of God and connecting to word of God, word of God will reveal the purpose for your life, purpose for your destiny purpose for your next step can somebody bless the Lord the word has a power to to let you see it and that's not how exactly it came to me I think I did. how do I do that? I did okay <laughs> I, think so. I don't I don't know I, I'm still missing something in there but I'll come to a next sermon series <laughs> but this is where I'm going to close the second point. This is my final point. All that message is for this. Please hear me this carefully if you can. They left Jerusalem because Jerusalem looks confusion to them. They left Jerusalem because Jerusalem looks like a chaos to them. They left Jerusalem because they didn't understand at all. They left that place in a sadness. Man, this Jesus of Nazareth did a great things and he left. The whole place is left. It looks so messy, chaos. So Cleophas decided, I'm not going to stay here. How many times you go into a messy families and three seconds later you're, like, you're telling your wife, let's get out of here. I ain't staying here. Have you been to a dinner party or a Thanksgiving dinner? You say, hey, what's up? How are you guys doing? And somebody in the table says, you have in this and you have in that. You, and you're like, what the? Oh, this is a messy family. I can't, I can't eat with y'all. Turkey looks good, but I ain't eating the turkey. That looks like the effing turkey too. <laughs> I'm, I'm out of here. But that's exactly what Cleophas and his friend or brother did. They left Jerusalem. But they didn't realize, they didn't leave the place, but they left a body of Christ. The body of Christ at the time was under oppression. Under persecution. The body was not so big as it is right now. We have right now, the Christianity is the second largest, no, first or second, I'm not sure, correct me later. I think the first largest, fastest growing in, in the world. Back in days, the whole body of Christ was 11 people. But Jesus knew even though there were 11, the life was given for them as well. And Jesus did not leave them alone in that place. Even though Peter was pinning his pants, but Jesus was not. Jesus understood his weakness, understood the 12 disciples' weakness as they were hiding in the place. But these two disciples left to Jerusalem and Jesus came to these two and explained all these things to make this known to them. Watch this. They rose that same hour return to what? Jerusalem. So the purpose of stranger coming into your life or their life, purpose of unpacking the scriptures, purpose of breaking the bread and blessing it is to fulfill Something that they did not know they're supposed to do. How many times we live a life day by day not even know what we're supposed to do. And we thought we're supposed to do this. And sometimes we think this. Being a husband is you're supposed to do. Now being a husband is your life. And being a father is what you do. But what I'm saying is being a child of God, you're supposed to do something with your life. Sometimes you might be stuck in your journey as discovering your purpose as they were. But God is being so 
patient with them and God will be patient with you. He will first to give you a stranger to let you see the word of God as the word of God sits in your belly. It about to change what's inside of you. Now the future that gets clear because the uncertain future will be burned away by the word of God that's burning within. When the word of God that burns within and the things that are around you will start burning away, then you can see clearly where you're supposed to go. You might have came from them, but God is calling you back to that place of chaos. That was preaching time. Right exactly when I closed it, G, Richard says, shut up. So, and they, I'm done. So they went, watch this, they went to the leaven. He said, hey, Lord is risen indeed. And Cleopas and his friend was there. And they told what had happened on the road. And how he was known to them. Now it was leaven a couple of hours ago. Now it became 13. What happened? Jesus added to his church two more souls. Oh, I'm getting there. Hold on right there. Hold on. I feel somebody all feel I'm getting right there. The purpose God appears to you. The purpose God gives you word. The purpose God reveals everything that you knew today is not for you, baby. It is for the edification of the body of Christ. What God is doing is, you're trying to get away from me, but I'm trying to get you back in where you're supposed to be. You gotta be in the body of Christ. Can I, can I, can I preach this for a second? For the level that we're really, and, and this is good for those that are going through like me or anybody here. You might be running away from very family that you hate, but God is calling you back to your family because this is is the year that the Lord will raise your family back to the kingdom of God. I don't know who I am preaching, but God is calling you back to the broken or to the broken family. God is calling you back to the dysfunction family. Because of you, your family will rise again. Because of you, your family will know my name. That's why he broke the bread. Because you, when, when I'm sincerely broken, I sincerely apologize. But I'm not broken. I can't apologize. God always breaks us first, then uses us next. The broken people understand the broken pieces. Broken people know what it means to be united. Broken people know what it means to be crying unto God for our souls for the kingdom of God. Broken people know what it takes to go through. Even though it doesn't seem like an exciting thing, I have to go through it because I've been broken for a blessing. You're called to be a blessed one for your family. They might reject you, but you can love on them. They might call you, label you, but you can show a love because you understand the concept of Christianity. It is not because Jesus died for me only. He died for my family. Satan cannot have my family. Devil cannot have my family. The political system cannot have my family. Me and my family will stand before the Lord and will tell Peter, you better open that gate, we came to heaven. 
If some of you are going through a health issue, you tell the sickness and devil, you ain't doing nothing to my body until I see my loved ones getting saved. By the end of my year, I need a two people. Give the Lord a hiccup because God is getting ready to save somebody in this. And that's how I talk. My wife says, my mother-in-law says, don't. Don't buy the motorcycle. A lot of people die in motorcycle accidents. I say, the death better take up my appointment. Because I ain't dying until, until the Lord says it's done. But death has no power over my life. He controls the death. Come on, somebody bless the Lord. We're not done until the Lord says it's done. I'm not buying the motorcycle. Don't worry about it. I love to have a motorcycle. Maybe I'll wait my, when my brother gets blessed, maybe he'll bless me. But I'm done. I want to I close your eyes. I want you to do it with all your heart, if you can. Think about one black sheep that's in your family. One black sheep. Or maybe multiple. Maybe the whole family. That God gave us a 2020. We want our loved ones to see God. We want our loved ones to know Christ. I'll take this few minutes with you and for you to pray for your loved ones. But my friend, you are connected to your family more than I am connected to your family. You have a blood covenant with your family. Jesus did not die for you alone. He died for the whole family. And I know you come to church by yourself as your spouse might be at home. I know you come to church by yourself as your kids might be doing something. I know as you follow Christ because that's the right thing to do. But part of you is broken because my family is not with me in the Lord. Or you might be here sitting that man. I wish God could save this person, that person. You might be praying and prayed and prayed. You gave up on praying. You might be here thinking, I don't know if God will ever save my family. But the Lord told me to tell you what you heard today is good enough for you to know that he has not forgotten about your family. As he saved you, he's going to save them. As he brought you into family of God, he's going to bring them into family of God. Because only Jesus can give peace and life, tranquility. But my friend, if you start praying for them, God start moving for them. When you start praying for them, Satan start moving for them. But when you continuously praying for them, God continuously opens the rain over their life. One day they will know as you knew. One day they will show up as you show up. One day they will say yes as you said yes. One day they will know for themselves. I'm not chasing after a religion. I'm chasing after a real man. A man from Nazareth. Who didn't have a lot of repetition, a lot of followers. His church is not more than 13 people. Yet he was able to give up everything he can for those 13. Now he's a renowned leader for the entire universe. But he never gave up in his initial stages of his life. He laid his life down. And they will know that he's real in their lives because this humble carpenter was able to destroy the power of sin. This humble carpenter is able to destroy the works of the devil. But when you continuously pray for your loved ones, God will continuously visit them. Father, I pray for your people and their loved ones. No matter where they are right now, God, we cannot reach them the way you alone can reach them. You know exactly what they're facing. You know exactly where they're tied up. 
You know exactly what they're into. You know exactly what they're against. You know exactly where they are living. We pray for them right now. God, let this be the year that we will go back to Jerusalem where our peace is. Jerusalem is a double peace. 2020 is a double portion of peace. God, I ask you this year, God, that our families come back to knowledge of Christ. Our families will say yes to salvation and yes to you. Thank you for opening up those doors for every person that are here, every person that are watching online. Thank you for this year that you're going to break through in our families. Thank you for bringing us back to you, saving our lives, and Lord, saving our eternal lives. And we give you the praise and honor. And we love you because you're so good to us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. There's no one else can do the way you do it to us. Lord, you didn't just save a, a guy in a prison when Timothy and Paul was in there. You saved the whole family of a, a jailer. And you have the power to do it. Now we're asking you this year, let our families be saved for the glory of God. Let our families come to know a peace of God. Let our families know what is the joy of the Lord is. Let our families come to know God is good to us. And we love you, God. I thank you for your grace that's been released in 2020 on behalf of every single person in this room and those that are listening and watch, watching this broadcast. And we pray blessings in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody give God a hand clap if you believe that God will visit your family. If you're here, or you might be far from God or you might not know fully how to get back to God. Maybe you're questioning about, I understand and I want it, but I don't know how to do it. Maybe you're online, you're watching us. You're probably confused between two different opinions of your heart. And I want to help you to make a better decision for your life. Jesus calling you to be part of his family. I'm going to pray this prayer and I'm going to lead you into this prayer. As you pray this prayer, I'm going to join my faith with your faith. Because God says when we call upon his name, we will find Christ and we will be saved. So all I want you to do is just repeat these words and believe in your heart. And be desperate as a Cleophas and his brothers were. As you lean on to Jesus today, he's about to show you something that you have never seen or felt before. I'm going to ask our church to rally around this prayer. But primarily those that are ready to pray this prayer. If you pray, something wonderful, marvelous will happen right now. Let's pray. Say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I have sinned against you, against me, and against everybody else. But today, I believe you died for my sins. You rose from the dead for my eternal life. I confess all my sins. I'm asking you, Lord, to come into my heart. And I declare you are my Lord and my God and my King in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Yes, my friend, if you pray the simple prayer, you are in the family of God. If you could just do us a favor and put this uh, uh, the slide for us, the last slide. Uh, what is that? Yes, thank you. If you pray the prayer, those that are online and those that are here, do us a favor for our church. You can just text word Jesus to 210-724-3353. And if you text us, we know that you have done it. We're not going to call you off, make it obvious to everybody. We just want to know that you did it so we can pray for you, number one. Number two, we want to help you to take next steps in your life. It only takes one text to let us know so that way we can also measure that our work is being beneficial to people that are coming to church. So if you made that 
made commitment to Jesus today, first time, if you could just let us know by texting that word Jesus, we would greatly appreciate that and want to thank you all for doing it. And you are part of the family and we welcome you. Come on church, somebody welcome somebody into the part of the family. And we promise you we're not going to be the best church in the city. We, tr we try to be the best church. But one thing we promise you, we will love you as you are. And we will, we're willing to pray and lead you into next level of your destiny. What's up, guys? John here from CJC Life. And we just want to thank you for checking us out today. Don't forget to share this message so that others around the globe can hear about what Christ has done for us. Be sure to check out our other messages just like this one, and I'll catch you next time.